Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of Reptile Misconceptions at Peculiar Pets. Today we're going to talk about probably the widest kept species of lizard in the pet trade at the moment, and that is the bearded dragon. Bearded dragons have been kept for a very long time in captivity, um, and with that kind of comes an awful lot of misconceptions, outdated information that just will not go away, um, and a lot of misunderstanding as well. Some of that is things literally that the technology didn't exist when we first kept them, so we've had to adapt how we keep, but some of it really is based in absolute nonsense. So I'm going to try and break this video down into sort of sections for you, so we'll discuss things like temperature, UV, substrate, the biggest of them all, diet, and things like handling and, and how these animals actually interact with us as well. So, enjoy. So most of the information that we're going to talk about today pertains to the central bearded dragon, so Pagona viticeps, which is what we would kind of class as the common bearded dragon in the pet trade. There are, however, other species available, and most of the information applies to those as well. This little lady is actually a Pagona viticeps hybridised with Pagona barbata, which is a larger, generally more aggressive species, although she's pretty chill. All the information counts for those as well, and then we also have the Rankins or the Black Sands Dragon, um, which also has very, very similar care, even though they are a bit smaller and they hit like slightly different humidity levels. Okay, first thing we're going to talk about is temperature. Now, bearded dragons are found in kind of arid scrublands, eucalypt forest, even out into rocky desert and that kind of area, but they are not found on sand dunes. <laughs> so when people think desert, we always think sand dunes, rolling kind of Arabian nights kind of thing. And that's simply not true. The environment that the, uh, the bearded dragon is actually found in is more like an open, rocky... The substrate is quite sandy still, but we will get to that in another section. Um, but they experience incredibly high temperatures, especially through summer. But they also have a very, very cold winter compared to their summer activity period. This means that the animals are not or cannot be active year-round, going into what we would call brumation. So, through their active period, bearded dragons want a basking surface temperature of around 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, which is about 115 Fahrenheit. If they're not provided with that, the animals can't get to their optimum uh, temperature, which is then what they need to fight off disease, digest food, become active, to cycle into breeding, and that kind of thing, and generally just stay healthy. What we have found over the years is that there is a strange myth that bearded dragons as babies can be kept much hotter than as adults or in some cases it's even been said that they need to be kept hotter than adults. Now there's two reasons this isn't true. <laughs> First being the sun does not simply get cooler just because the animals reached a year old. The other thing is that the animal's metabolism doesn't really change as far as its needs. Now it does change in what they actually eat. Now an adult bearded dragon doesn't eat as much live food as a young bearded dragon because they're simply not trying to grow as much. But the temperature is needed to digest plant matter that are say, the uh, same that are needed to digest insects and other lizards and whatever else these guys are eating are pretty much the same. And they are still able to reach those temperatures in the wild by either using rocks in the sun or moving into shade and thermoregulating like every other sort of reptile species would do. So alongside that, we also need to be able to allow these animals to cool down. So we want to provide them a cool end no higher than sort of 28, 29 degrees Celsius. If the animals can't cool down, like they would be able to do in the wild, we start to see problems where they don't store fat properly and often they burn it too quickly. So we see things like anorexia. Um, it also can lead to things like um, neurological issues. So basically the animal's brain starts to overheat and its muscles start to overheat, which can eventually be lethal. So a lot of people kind of go into this thinking, bit of dragons need to be hot and that's it but it's a very specific hot, as it is with all reptiles. So, the myth goes that an adult bearded dragon can be kept at, with a basking surface of between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius. Now, that is actually what their optimum body temperature is. It's around 37. Um, if you want to check out Bearded Vets page on Facebook, he's actually done an awful lot of wild research on bearded dragons at the minute, and we will be referencing a lot of his information throughout this video. So the average temperature found on most was, I think, around 37 degrees Celsius. However, the animal would have to bask for a very long time to reach those temperatures in captivity if it's not provided an extra few degrees. And when you think of how hot surfaces will get out in the wild for these guys, when they're experiencing air temperatures in the mid to high 30s, maybe even low 40s, 
there are going to be rocks that are 40, 45, 50, maybe even more degrees Celsius available to them to use. These guys as well, through human influence, have started using tarmac roads in order to keep themselves warm. Um, and Beardy got to say that apparently it is adult males that use those more, which I would imagine is to do with getting up to temperature so they can go out and defend territories, look for females, and be just that much more impressive to the females. They then say, so providing you're 36 to 38 for the, uh, for the animals and adult, but below a year old, and this tends to be more prevalent in American uh, internet forums and care sheets, and more so care sheets that are a bit outdated now, your baby should be given a basking spot of between 40 and 43 degrees Celsius, which is actually right. <laughs> and that was basically to do with, they're eating more bugs, they need higher temperatures, um, and they, they need to be sort of kept warmer to keep themselves metabolising. On the flip side to that, they then say that this makes baby bearded dragons very susceptible to dehydration. Now, being susceptible to dehydration in an arid species like the bearded dragon doesn't make sense from a survival standpoint. <laughs> so what was happening was people were creating these superheated basking spots and not giving any coolant. And there is also the misconception that they don't need water, which again, we'll come to another section. When provided with a safe gradient, so there are surface temperatures that we're talking about there, but the ambient temperature in the warm is going to be sort of mid-30s, mid around sort of 32 to 36. The animal then needs to be able to cool down properly, whether it's an adult or a baby. They then say that at a year old, you should then turn these temperatures down for some reason, um, simply because the adults can cope with lower temperatures, but it doesn't mean that the animals suddenly have no need for these higher temperatures or shouldn't be allowed the option to be these higher temperatures. We also hear everything from people misunderstanding that ambient and surface temperatures are very different. So when we talk about wild information quite a lot, um, we're actually getting air temperatures. Now, Beardy Vet in his research has done surface temperatures, which has been incredibly helpful and has basically um, confirmed what we've always sort of said about using a surface temperature around 40, 45 degrees Celsius, because that's about what these guys are able to find on a daily basis in the summer. Now, so we keep those temperatures all the way through spring, summer, autumn. Another kind of newer push with bearded dragons is actually enforcing brumation. Now bearded dragons are not active year round and brumation for a new keeper can be a very very stressful time because your dragon goes from being this cute little baby, it grows like a weed for six or nine months and then it hits its first winter and it suddenly just stops. Moving, eating, drinking, sometimes they even look a bit dead when they're doing it as well. This is absolutely normal and it is temperature linked as well as air pressure as well. So as the air pressure changes, these guys know that the season, sorry, season is changing and that then puts them into this kind of, brumation is essentially a semi-hibernation. We are gonna do a video on brumation in general because there's quite a varied um, outcome to it depending on the species, depending on the environment they're actually found in. So these bearded dragons in the wild basically dig a hole, they go down and again on Beardy Vet you can find sort of temperature readings that these guys are sitting at and they basically become dormant and they stop most of their bodily functions, they run on very, very little energy and they live off the fat stores in this tail. So if we don't enforce that in captivity, the chances are the dragon is still going to pick up on things like air pressure and low night temperatures in your house or even things like being drier because through once we put our uh, central heating on, we start to dry the air out in our house and the dragons go, oh, it's getting a bit different, I should probably go and become inactive. There's really nothing to worry about with this. As long as the animal still has the option to bask, most will do sort of once a week or every couple of weeks, they'll sort of get up, have a mad half hour, but that then becomes more stressful for the keeper because you're trying to work out why your dragon looks dead and then all of a sudden is alive and then goes back to looking dead again. What we started doing, what a lot of the, uh, the more sort of up-to-date Facebook groups and things like that have started recommending is that we actually enforce these cooler temperatures. So once your dragon starts to show that it's slowing down a little bit, its food intake's dropping off, we then basically turn the tank off. So we slowly and gradually take the temperature down just how it would happen in the wild. So as the sun becomes lower in the sky and we start to get what is essentially winter, these guys would take that hint, the UV index would drop as well and they would start to go and burrow down. If we are enforcing this, we have to be very, very careful because we are removing something that's quite important to the dragon. Now, brumation is not necessarily a healthy process to go through. It's quite hard to kind of word that. 
it keeps the animal from becoming obese. They have adapted to doing this, and it is also a way to avoid bad weather and bad conditions and a massive lack of food. Because once the temperature drops, there's no insects, there's no plant life being particularly uh, that's particularly growing. If we enforce that in captivity, we are putting a lot of stress on the animal. However, in species like the Mediterranean tortoise, so Hermans, Marginatis, Greek spurs, it's been shown a few times that if the animals aren't hibernated fully and properly throughout their life, it can lead to problems with their liver um, and they can have other problems with sort of weight gain and, and general sort of obesity linked problems like you would see in any animal that's overweight. Over the years, we've seen quite a few obese bearded dragons. It is the number one problem that we see with dragons. Um, and a lot of the time, it is this constant battle to keep them awake through brumation. Whereas if you just let them be, they'll burn a very, very small amount of body fat if it's done correctly. So dropping those temperatures down, we reduce the hours of UV lighting as well. And the dragon then knows what it's doing and has the right conditions. If the animal is inactive, but still very warm, they can begin to burn body fat when they're trying not to, which can then lead to them looking skinny or losing condition quite quickly, when normally we'd expect a really, really gradual loss in weight. Uh, an adult bearded dragon that I brumated uh, lost about five grams in about eight weeks. Um, in fact, it might have been a touch longer than that. Um, so we are talking tiny, tiny amounts of weight, especially for something that weighs 250, 300 grams. Losing 10, 15 grams in a few weeks is not a big issue for them. When we're bringing them back out the other side of this, we kind of reverse the process and it can take a very long time. People often expect these instant results when they sort of turn that bulb back on, they expect the dragon to just go ping, back to life, and it's not how that works. It's a very gradual increase in temperature, again, gradually increasing the day length to then try and con this animal into thinking, actually it's spring again, and then you should have an active period through summer as you normally would. Of course, with anything that we're doing like that that is linked to major changes in temperature or major changes in behaviour, a vet is always worth having on hand. So if you are ever worried about the weight of your dragon during brumation, or even through the height of summer, which we'll get to in a second, always, always, always tell your vet first. Obviously, we get asked a lot, and generally our response is, go to a vet. When you are enforcing uh, brumation as well, it's important that the animal has been tested for worms. Now, bearded dragons eat live food, and some of that live food, being crickets in particular, can carry things like pinworm and uh, coccidia. Now, it's not that crickets inherently have these issues, or that they inherently have these parasites, it's that they can pick them up along the way, in the same way as the dragon can actually carry salmonella and show no real outward signs. Putting an animal into brumation, while it's got any underlying problems, could be detrimental to the animal. So we have to be very, very careful before we go, right, that's it, you're going into winter. On the flip side, through the middle of summer, again we have this, they need to be kept hot. Yes, they do. But as we said earlier, they need to be able to move out of that temperature. So in the wild they would have a home burrow or a tree stump, just something where they could get completely into the shade, completely out of that red hot sun, and be able to cool their temperature down. So in summer we see people saying, oh well, uh, we've moved the enclosure into the conservatory or it faces a south facing window and it gets really good sun through the glass every day that is one of the most dangerous things you can do with a bearded dragon it was more prevalent when people were using glass tanks a lot for these guys because glass being that lovely greenhouse effect that we get becomes a very good magnifier for sunlight but even with the wooden glass fronted vivariums that we use nowadays there is still a massive issue with overheating if the vivarium is positioned wrong i have seen I think four in total now, where people thought they were doing the right thing, giving the animal extra heat, it's got natural sunlight, even though glass does filter UVB rays, so it wasn't actually benefiting the animal at all. But because the animal seemed more active, they thought they were doing the right thing, and then all of a sudden we have a very emaciated, very dehydrated dragon that could potentially die. So when it comes to summer and active periods, be very, very careful with where your enclosure is positioned. And the same goes for radiators. We don't want radiators right behind vivs or on, on the cool end of the viv because that would just mess the entire gradient up. The other kind of side of summer that we see a lot, and this has been touched on, I think, in one of Snakes and Adders' videos as well, is taking these animals outside. Now, the UV index where the guy, these guys come from is horrendous. You would burn instantly <laughs> you would end up red raw if you sat out there with no sun cream at midday. Now these animals are protected against this, like we talked about in our UV video, they have thicker scales, they know how to thermoregulate properly, so obviously they would use burrows, they'd move into the shade. 
these guys are built for that kind of environment. The same goes for temperature. These guys have a very high active temperature. And in order to complete the D3 cycle, that has to go hand in hand. They have to be able to reach that temperature of about 37, 38 degrees, and they have to have the UV index at the highest sort of touching about five, six, is what we would use in an enclosure. In the wild, they would experience much higher levels, but they just move much quicker out of that heat in order to not oversupply themselves or cause any damage. When you look at the UK's UV index, even on the hottest day, I took my UV meter outside and I got a reading of 4.1, which is all right for a bearded dragon. It's not going to die at that. Problem was, the air temperature was only about 24 degrees. What that means is the animal is not receiving both sides of the D3 cycle. It is not receiving natural temperatures. It is not getting any real benefit apart from sunlight is, has other benefits than UVB. But if you think popping your dragon outside in summer is a completely great way to kind of negate having a UV light on or you don't need a heat lamp on, he goes outside for 10 minutes a day. Unfortunately, that isn't true in the UK. Now, a lot of this information comes from people living in the southern United States, so out in like Arizona or in Florida, where yes, you can keep your bearded dragon outside because they have UV index of sort of four to six in summer, they have really high temperatures and the dragons can function completely normally. We just don't have that over here. And it is one of my biggest gripes with keeping tortoises outside all year round is that we do not have the conditions these animals actually need. They're just very, very tolerant. But again, that's another video. So if you want to take a dragon outside, there are benefits and there are ways and means of doing it. Sunlight has more in it than just UVB, obviously. Now UVA is important for their vision and it's very stimulating for them to be outside. On a very, very hot day, if you have a warm surface like dark decking or slate patio, that kind of thing, you will probably get surface temperatures that this animal actually needs. But the animal must be completely supervised because for all the benefits it will be getting sitting in natural sunlight, it will also be freaking out because these guys get eaten by birds an awful lot. And there is a third eye in the middle of their head called a pineal eye. And that basically it detects shadows, light and dark. And um, it's not entirely sort of clear what its function is, but it definitely helps them see shadow, definitely helps them see um, sort of light intensity so that they can work out light exposure. But the biggest cause of shadows to a bearded dragon would be a bird crossing the sun. And when a bearded dragon sees a bird, it runs. So these guys can move incredibly fast. They can scale fencing, no problem. They can do brick walls if they really need to. So if you're taking your dragon outside, please, please, please make sure it is in something secure and make sure it has shade. Because we tend to have a weird thing in this country where we go from being comfortable to all of a sudden the surface temperatures are just ridiculous and you're talking 50, 60 degrees Celsius on dark surfaces and the dragon then can't cool down. So we have to make sure essentially it's in a mini viv outside. But please do not put glass or wood enclosures in the sun thinking that you are benefiting your dragon. Okay. Another misconception with heating, and it is a very old misconception, we don't tend to see it very often, is that bearded dragons uh, need belly heat to digest their food. Now, this hasn't really been put out there for a lot of years, but it is untrue. <laughs> so, but we still see the use, certainly with sort of people using very old information to sort of do their setups or make their sales in particular, where they suggest a heat mat should be used for a bearded dragon on a night or during the day if you're struggling with basking temperatures. Now there's two things wrong with this. So night temperature, where these guys come from, is quite low. Um, you're, you're talking teens most of the time. Even through summer you might only be talking low 20s. What that's basically caused by is through the day, awful lot of heat, but there's not really any water to evaporate. So we don't tend to get cloud cover. So although it's very, very hot through the day, on a night a lot of that heat is lost and it becomes quite cool in most sort of arid and desert environments. The humidity is slightly different, which we will come to when we talk about hydration a bit later on. But these guys basically, they find a burrow, get themselves at a comfortable temperature, and in captivity we kind of try and keep them anything above about 14 degrees Celsius. Most people aim for sort of 16 to 18, knowing that you've got a couple of degrees play below it and it can go a little bit warmer if we want. You'll see a lot of people suggesting like ceramic heat on a night to keep them at like 20, 22 degrees. It's just not necessary. These guys benefit from a massive drop in temperature at night to allow the metabolism to stop and to basically simulate what they would have in the wild as well. So we don't need a heat mat at night. If we do desperately need night heat, so if we're talking like 11, 12 degrees, then a ceramic heat emitter on a 
dimming thermostat or a pulse thermostat is absolutely fine to use, but it should only be used at night. The other kind of thing with the belly heat, uh, where people say that you can use it as a supplementary basking uh, heater, is also kind of misguided and generally wrong. Bearded dragons, like most day active lizards, um, kind of detect the temperature through their back. So most things that tell a bearded dragon how hot it is running through its spine. So they don't really feel heat from underneath. They're not looking for belly heat. They're not going, oh, my belly's warm. This is where I should sit. They're looking for overhead bright lighting that then tells them that's the hot bit. And then they move to cool and dark to cool down. If we pop a heat mat underneath there, the animal also being quite thick will start to block the heat from that heat mat. Now, because it's trying to heat through the whole animal before the animal goes, oh, I'm a bit warm, we start to see things like burns. We can also see um, kind of hot spots on heat mats, and that tends to be with older products. They don't do it as much nowadays. Um, and we can start seeing belly burns and feet burns and that kind of thing. The other problem as well is that these guys need quite a deep substrate, which, again, we'll talk about a bit later. We cannot put a heat mat under deep substrate. It's a very good way to set fire to the barium, and it's a very, very good way to make absolutely no benefit for your mat, which is just designed to heat what is sat on top of it. They do not heat the air. So as a general rule, please do not put heat mats in your <laughs> bearded dragon's barium. It's either unsafe or completely unnecessary. The other thing with the heat mats as well is that they're not actually waterproof. So when you have a bearded dragon moving around its water bowl or even just pooing, their poo is quite messy and disgusting. If that manages to get moisture inside the heat mat, it could blow it or, worst case scenario, set it on fire. So we do not want anything like that happening inside the vivarium, especially seeing as there's absolutely no reason to be using that heat element in there at all, as long as you've got the correct heating. What we would use as correct heating for daytime basking animals like the bearded dragon is a halogen heat lamp. Now, a few people still use ceramics, and it kind of works, um, but halogens give out all three waves of infrared, um, which is quite important for simulating sunlight to these guys alongside the UVB lighting and the UVA lighting. So we tend to use halogens, we use them in all our tanks for the dragons in here, because we get a lot of infrared A and a lot of infrared B, which is what kind of penetrates deep into these guys to warm their muscles properly, keep their digestion working and that kind of thing. Ceramics tend to only produce uh, infrared C, which doesn't really penetrate as deep, so we don't tend to get the same warming effect. The uh, best way to think of it is if you have a little electric fan heater on and it's just sort of blowing warm air around and you turn it off, you're suddenly cold. Whereas if you have like a, an actual fire in front of you and you put your hands to it, you feel it warming through your skin and through your muscles and that kind of thing, you feel warmer for afterwards. That's kind of the same process that we're hitting here. Halogens as well are very, very good at raising surface temperatures. So we'll generally aim a uh, sorry, a halogen. We'll generally aim a halogen over something like a slate or a dark rock or even a, a branch or something like that to then create these surface temperatures of 40, 45 degrees Celsius without necessarily overheating the air in the tank. Because ceramics are also very good at heating sideways as well as down. We don't get much sort of direct heat from a ceramic, which is what these guys are looking for, is that kind of beam of sunlight that they can go and sit in warm themselves up thoroughly and then go about their day. It's also been shown as well, I believe Roman Murin did um, some research into this, that um, certain wavelengths of infrared are actually quite important in healing as well. So things like wounds, cuts and scrapes, um, I'm not sure if it was fungal or bacterial um, that he talked about, but it cleared up an infection in, the, in a turtle that he had. Um, so when it was exposed to full sunlight and that then pushed him to look into infrared and there is all this information is out there uh, if you go on advancing herpetological husbandry uh, forum all that information is there in the files and it's a really really interesting read and it will change how you eat your reptiles so yeah that's kind of it for heating like i say a lot of the stuff is outdated you it's so simple to heat these guys properly but as usual it's a minefield so we're aiming for 40 45 on the basking spot no matter how old the dragon is we're aiming for a cool end below 28 degrees Celsius, and we want to make sure that we're using a bright basking lamp or halogen lamp aimed at a surface to try and give those nice warm basking temperatures so the animal can function properly. The next thing we're going to talk about is UVB lighting. Now, there isn't much misconception about this anymore. Um, it's basically generally accepted that bearded dragons must have UVB lighting in order to stay healthy, to metabolize calcium properly, so through the D3 cycle and a few other benefits to it as well. The problem that we have is not all UVB is made equal. So for these guys, especially in America, it's still quite prevalent. We see a lot of people using compact UV lamps for these guys. They just don't produce the levels they need. We want a UV index at the basking spot between sort of four and six. That way these guys can move to 
full exposure and then in the cool zone we want pretty much zero or under a hide we want zero and that allows the animal a full UVB range across its, its enclosure. So we see a lot of compact UV, they're rubbish, please don't put them on bearded dragons, they have uses for things like smaller geckos or amphibian species that want low localised UVB output but they do not work for day, day, daytime basking especially desert species like these guys that are looking for that intense UV output. The other thing that we see as well, is, again in America, is mercury vapour lamps. Now, mercury vapours are not a bad UV source. They're not as good as T5s, which we'll talk about in a second, but they're not a bad UV source. The biggest problem with mercury vapours is they cannot be thermostated. Now, because they give out localised high UV levels and localised high heat, they're designed to be used in large enclosures for basking species. So things like giant tortoises or even things like iguanas or bigger gamas like sail fins and water dragons. But because they can't be thermostated, we have no control over that temperature. So we have to be very, very careful about how we use them. So you see people popping those above mesh, above glass tanks and that kind of thing. It's, it's not the best way to do it. It's not the worst, but it's not the best way to do it. The other thing that I've also heard, and it is a rescue centre that uh, pushed this out there. I cannot remember her name and I wouldn't name and shame her anyway. Um, but there are people out there that adamant that bearded dragons do not need access to UVB light in captivity. And I cannot believe that in 2020 we are still having this argument. MBD is prevalent in bearded dragons that are not provided the correct care, the correct lighting, the correct heating, the correct supplements, and that's basically the same for every single reptile. If you can get those four things correct, you will not get MBD. But people like to cut corners, and that's where this has come from. This lady has basically been rescuing bearded dragons. She hasn't put them under UV, and she has pumped their systems full of synthetic D3 uh, supplements, things like, like up in the UK, we have Nutribar, we have Reptivite, we have Nutrirep, Repton, all these products that are very high in D3. And that was good when we didn't have the UV technology, but now we have it, we just don't need to risk things like overdose or organ damage through overdosing on these vitamins. But her and her little group are adamant that they do not need it as long as they are supplemented with D3. And I can tell you 100% they are wrong. It's dangerous advice. And if anyone tells you that, you do need UVB lighting. Now, our preference is to use either T8 or T5 strip lights for these guys, both in 12%, depending on the height of your enclosure. Now, the T8 was the kind of the best that we had, um, sort of in the 90s and early 2000s. And then the T5 became a thing and it kind of blew T8 out of the water. So T8 comes in usually 5, 6, 10, 12% or 10.0, depending on brands that they're all sort of labeled slightly different. But they usually have like a forest output and a desert output. Uh, and they last somewhere between sort of 4 and 12 months, depending on the brand, depending on the model. Always, always check the recommendations on the back. When we're using T8s, they don't have a particularly high um, range on them, so we want the animals to be able to get within sort of like six or eight inches of the tube, depending on the model, uh, sorry, depending on the brand. We're adding a reflector to that light with any UV, puts that range out a bit further. We generally use the T8s if we're looking at 18 inch tall tanks, because then we can keep a safe range on those. We can use a reflector to push it down a bit further, and you can now get T8s that last. 12 months as well, so the Arcadia D3 Plus, uh, the Zoomed 10.0 as well as 12 month replacement. Those bulbs are great and they do the job in lower slung tanks where we don't have that height to create a safer UV gradient. Once we're looking in the 422, which in the UK is kind of the standard size for a bearded dragon, we need to be using T5 lighting. Um, T8s, although they'll do it, they're just not going to do it quite as well. And to be fair, for the price difference now between T8 and T5, you can almost get a T5 system cheaper than you can a T8, which, why wouldn't you? So the Pro T5 system, uh, which is what's in the Sav uh, Savannah, Monitor uh, <laughs> Savannah Monitor Viv behind me, um, it's a similar unit to the Shade Dwellers that are up there, but it's a much higher output. So the Pro Kit comes in 6, 12 and 14%. So we would use a 12% T5 in a two foot tall tank and the animal wants to be able to get within about 12 to 15 inches of that tube, which we can perfectly achieve in that enclosure, giving the right UV index for the animal and then allowing a full gradient down to the cool end. The 14%, although it is a fantastic bulb, should only really be used in things that are sort of two and a half, three feet tall to allow that extra space. 
it can put usable UV um, for a bearded dragon down to about 18 to 24 inches. So we've got to be very, very careful what size enclosures we use those in. Although, yes, these guys would be exposed to really, really high output UV. They aren't exposed to it all day without the option to move out of it. And it's having that gradient that makes UVB safe in captivity. And the option is another kind of big part of captive keeping. So yeah, like I say, there aren't many misconceptions with UV. It's kind of, they do need it. <laughs> it's not really a misconception, it's just a statement. Um, but the best ways to provide it are going to be T8, 10 or 12% and T5, 12 or 14, depending on the height of your enclosure. But it must be in there. You want a tube that's going to cover half to two thirds of your enclosure and that will then keep these animals healthy. Please, please, please do not listen to the people that say they don't need UVB. They're simply just ignoring research that is so easy to find just for the sake of laziness, really. Hydration and bearded dragons is one of the most debated, probably second most debated areas of uh, their care over the years. Now, it has been very divisive. There are groups and sort of camps that will say you must never ever have water in your bearded dragon's viv because it will get scale rot, it will get infections in its skin, and it will get respiratory infections, and it will basically just die. What these people seem to forget is that standing water is a thing. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, yes, they're from dry environments, but they are not from the Atacama Desert. <laughs> there is water, there is humidity where these guys come from. It does actually rain where these guys come from. Really interesting piece of information as well. Um, Francis, uh, I really can't pronounce your surname, I'm very, very sorry Francis, but everyone knows Francis. He found uh, some amazing information about bearded dragons basically inflating their bodies um, during flash floods and they actually float away. So these guys are even adapted to be around water, even moving water. So that's worth bearing in mind as well. There's the other side, there's actually three sides to this. There's kind of middle ground where they're like, yeah, have a water bowl in there, but make sure that you bath them. I don't know if my face said it all then. <laughs> Bathing bearded dragons is absolutely totally unnecessary <laughs> unless of course they have been sliding through their own mess at which point they're absolutely filthy and they stink like a pig farm yeah give them a wash then but soaking a dragon comes from this old misconception that they can drink through their bum or through their cloaca they can't it's been proven several times now they've done studies where they've given a dragon a, a dye in the water and they've basically seen what it's taken in and it didn't take any of the dye through its bum, but it did drink it like any normal animal would do. I think a lot of this comes from another misconception that tortoises could do it. So we used to bath tortoises constantly, but even nowadays that's not as prevalent as it used to be because people have realised actually they just drink. In the wild, bearded dragons get the majority of their uh, water from their food. And also on an evening, even in drier areas of the world, uh, the humidity actually spikes. Now, a lot of reptiles have actually adapted. Now, the most interesting one that does this is the veiled or Yemen chameleon. Um, Peter Nakas did an amazing uh, study on that and found that these animals actually breathe all the moisture that they need. Um, and I believe it was a, an adult male uh, gained like a gram or a gram and a half overnight just from breathing water. Bearded dragons are no exception, so their burrows are higher humidity. The air on an evening is higher uh, is, is higher in humidity. So these guys are able to hydrate a little bit that way as well through breathing slightly higher humidity levels. Then of course, when it rains, they will drink. When it's sort of early morning dew, they will drink. There are so many opportunities for these animals to stay alive basically in the wild and water is obviously an important part of that. So they have adapted different ways to find it. There is standing water where they come from, there's rivers, there's streams, all this kind of thing, and they just, that's where they are found, it is near these kind of bodies of water. Uh, there is also some uh, fell out there being found on the beach, which is quite cool as well. Obviously they're not drinking seawater, but obviously fresh water runs into the sea. So yeah, we tend to go on a nice middle ground of they need a water bowl that they can drink from. So everyone goes, yep, but my dragon doesn't drink. That's simply because your dragon doesn't need to drink. Now, I've seen dragons that will drink regularly. I have seen dragons, well, I have had dragons that I've never seen drink, um, but they've drunk, say, when we've sprayed them or if we've dripped water onto their nose and that kind of thing. For newer keepers, we tend to, especially with younger dragons, um, we tend to say, give them a quick mist on a morning. Won't hurt. You're not trying to raise the humidity, but that quick opportunity to have a little drink on a morning is perfectly fine for these guys. And most mornings, they'll completely ignore it. 
they'll just go about the business, they'll be a bit outsourced because you've just sprayed them in the face. Um, but other than that, we don't really need to panic. As long as water is available, these guys can and do drink from still water. The other kind of way that people are doing it as well is you can run foggers on an evening. Now this is very, very new and it's not quite being done for bearded dragon jets, so we don't know how safe this would be for them. But for species like the veiled chameleon, where it's really, really important, fogging them on an evening has actually meant that they don't really drink when they're, when they're kept this way. So there are other ways to hydrate a dragon other than bathing it twice a week. The other problem with bathing them um, is these guys are, well, like all reptiles, tend to hold water in their bodies until they're in the presence of fresh water. So when you pop a beardy in a bath, it tends to go to the toilet. And that's because its body has found fresh water, so it can rehydrate itself. But it won't lose what water it had before until it knows it can recoup it. So they tend to do these really big, hard urate lumps because they've been holding onto it. Or they do really, really sloppy ones because you're bathing them twice a week and they're constantly clearing themselves out. And they will also poo. This tends to be premature, so it basically not so much forces the animal to poo, but it encourages them to get rid of what's there just because they're in the presence of water. That's not healthy. It's not good for them. A healthy dragon that is eating its veg and eating a, a balanced diet should not have any problems going to the toilet. They may only poo once a week, once every four days. It just means that they're taking everything out of their food before they're getting rid of it. The other thing that we hear as well is that your bath should be quite warm. Now that dragon has been basking at say 45 degrees and it's got itself up to a temperature of so 37, 38 degrees and then you stick it in a bath that is either cooler or hotter than that animal and it's really not going to be happy. We need to make sure if we are bathing for say medical reasons, because there are reasons that we do soak dragons but believe me drinking through its bum is not one of them, then we need to make sure that water is perfectly uh, measured so that we don't overheat, underheat or in extreme cases shock the animal. Um, if we put them in water that's far too cold, we can cause cramping in the muscles and they can actually drown. Um, so you have to be very, very careful with that. So if you do have to do it for any reason, make sure it's safe and make sure your vet has told you what you're doing with it and that kind of thing. Some people also like to provide large water areas inside their vivarium. Now, I'm in two minds and the jury is still out on this. Some people think it's cool, so others don't. And it's a bit of a personal choice. Allowing the animal the option to soak kind of makes sense to me. They do fine standing water, especially for having these things like flash floods or, or heavy rains in spring. But I'm not sure if having that in there all the time is necessarily a good idea. So we tend to go something that the animal can drink from comfortably. It can't throw it everywhere because they're good at that. But if we go too big, we are going to raise that humidity in that enclosure. On the subject of that, there is a camp that says you cannot put a water bottle in your bearded dragon's enclosure because it will raise the humidity too high and give them respiratory infections, uh, skin problems, all this kind of stuff, and that's not true. If your enclosure is so poorly ventilated that you are able to raise the humidity just from having a water bottle in there, then your enclosure is the problem, not the water bottle. Most vivariums come with sort of two to six uh, vents in the back, and they are positioned so that it draws warm air in that will get rid of the humidity. Now, humidity for the wild dragon is somewhere between sort of 30 and 50 is a kind of comfortable. Um, I believe there's spikes on an evening to sort of like 60, 65, which is the level I was just talking about. In captivity, generally speaking, we don't need to spray them for humidity. We don't need to try and dry them out um, unless your house is particularly humid or particularly dry. Um, I think if you lived somewhere like Arizona, you might need to add, and you had air con, you might need to humidify the enclosure a little bit, but we don't, we live in the UK. Most houses run between sort of 40 and 60% humidity. The shop runs at I think 63 most of the time. Sometimes it's 66, sometimes down to 60. So we generally don't add humidity for these guys. You'll also hear things like you can't have live plants in there because they will raise the humidity. Plants exist in the wild. The humidity doesn't suddenly spike through the roof just because plants are there. Again, if your enclosure isn't heated correctly or ventilated correctly, yeah, humidity is going to be a problem for your dragon, but it's not the humidity, it's the moulds, the bacterial growth and that kind of thing from stagnant air, not humid air, that we would then see problems with. And again, it's that kind of misunderstanding of what they're trying to tell you that then leads to these old wives tales of, oh, water bowls kill your bearded dragon. Now, there are species where that is true. So, Euromastics, we generally never put water in those guys because they are from such dry areas and they have basically evolved never to drink. So, we just don't do it. Um, but they eat 
food that is then high in moisture so they can then get their hydration that way. The dragons can drink and do drink and have the option to drink in the wild. So it's something that we should be allowing them to do in captivity to keep them healthy that way. Option is the best option really. Everyone's favourite debate on the internet is the substrate debate. <laughs> now I could do an entire video on this because it is just such a huge area of misunderstanding, poor information, sometimes just bad keeping um, and just general scaremongering and yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> if you've ever witnessed a substrate debate, well done for living through it. If you haven't, give it five minutes on a Facebook group, you'll find one. <laughs> Bearded dragons <laughs> are found in sandy soil areas. Uh, there are trees growing there, so there is soil. It's not just sand. Uh, Beardy Vet did a brilliant kind of like video showing the composition of it and he did a few like tests and things. Um, and there was a significant amount of sand in that substrate. Now these guys, it is dry, but it is not loose sand. There is still moisture in the deep soil and that kind of thing. Obviously the plant roots help. Um, and also because the soil is there, it binds it together a little bit and um, it also compacts it slightly. But these guys dig burrows. So that substrate is not concrete hard. It is not like when you see like a baked lake um, out in Africa and stuff where it all cracks and it's like concrete. That's not what these guys live on at all, no matter what some bearded dragon groups will tell you. It is a loose-ish sand, soil, clay, and there's lots of rocks in there as well kind of mix. This allows them to dig burrows in it. It allows trees to root so it can't be rock hard. Um, and that's what we should really be trying to emulate in captivity. So beardy life, habistat bearded dragon substrate, biolife arid, arid earth mix, all these different amazingly named products that all basically recreate the same thing. Now personally I like beardy life just because it's red and it looks like it's meant to do, but beardy life, leo life, pro rep arid life, all the habistat range, all the arcadia range, mixing your own topsoil and place and all of that looks quite messy. Um, it all does the same job. We want something that's loose and going to move, but if they start digging into it, holds together a little bit and clumps so that we don't get this kind of shifting sands kind of effect. So I'm not a lover of sand just on its own, although it, it can be used. Um, wood chips kind of the same thing. It moves too much, doesn't really give them the same support. My biggest bugbear and dislike when it comes to substrate and bearded dragons is that they should be kept on slate, tiles, lino or a bare vivarium floor. No, <laughs> they shouldn't. Um, these guys are natural diggers. Um, having substrate means that you don't have to clean as often, so you're not constantly scrubbing their enclosure and then keeping them in this super chemical-filled environment because you've disinfected it three times a day, especially when they're a baby. Spot cleaning is the easiest way to keep these guys clean, and it also means that we're not disturbing the animal constantly, especially when they're settling in, because if you've got no substrate, you've got to clean the whole thing every time it poos, and a baby might poo two or three times a day. That's not going to help an animal settle. The other thing we have as well on a bare floor is when the animal is scooting around, it's not got a huge amount of choice but to stand in that poo, and it then rubs it into wood grain and all this, whereas in substrate, most of the time once they've pooed, it's covered in soil, you can then take that out and they've usually gone and dug somewhere else. It has been linked as well to joint problems in later life with bearded dragons, so animals kept on solid surfaces, now slate is quite a big one because it gets warm and it's easy to clean, um, and those kind of substrates, it's been linked to because it's not allowing their joints to sort of support them properly. It's very solid. It's like with walking on tarmac for long distances, you get kind of knee pains and that kind of thing. That has then been linked to essentially like arthritis kind of symptoms in older dragons. You also have the risk as well as if the dragon jumps or falls, it's falling on a very hard surface and depending how high your enclosure is, that may do some damage as well. My biggest bug barrier that is it is not easy to clean. You have to scrub your entire viv all the time. If you just do the bit it pooed on, well, what if you've missed a bit and all that kind of thing. If you're trying to keep them completely like septic clean, then yeah, you're probably not gonna do it. My other problem with tiles as well is they have gaps. So if poo dries before you get to it, they, poo, they kick it down the sides and you've then got this layer of poo under your tiles which is not great as far as sort of hygiene, smell, or even just, just general look of it. It just looks awful. But some people like to do that as part of their enclosure. That's fine. Substrate mixes, I'm not really going to go into on this. 
The other kind of misconception with all substrate is impaction, and it drove the no substrate method for quite a while, is that if bearded dragon eats any loose substrate, it will basically burst into flame, implode on itself, and instantly die. That is simply not true, or it is only partly true. <laughs> loose substrate is not the cause of impaction, with the exception of calcium sand. Now, calcium sand and walnut sand, I do not like. I will never like. <laughs> they are products that were sold out as safe. And I have the same view of the corn cob substrates as well. They've got all kinds of different brand names, but basically calcium sand, walnut sand, and corn cob are probably the least safe loose substrates out there. Calcium sand is made of calcium, so these animals know that they need calcium. So we're essentially keeping them on something that we are encouraging them to eat. And we encourage something called geophagy, and it's then self-supplementation. Kind of in the same way as leopard geckos will take calcium out of a dish, it's not a behaviour you want to encourage, because that animal is then deficient in calcium and looking for it outside of its diet, but it's something that, as a backup, is fair enough. Calcium sand, unfortunately, when it gets wet, becomes like concreted and it starts to clump. This can happen inside the animal's gut, and that's what causes blockages. Now, some animals can be kept on calcium sand for years and years and years, and they're absolutely fine, they never have a problem, and the reason for that is usually they are supplemented properly. But any lapse or any kind of dehydration or any accidental eating of it or the temperatures aren't quite right, there's just too many factors to keep calcium sand safe. So really, as a product, it's just not worth using. It's a shame because it looks quite funky. It comes in like bright pink and bright blue and stuff. It makes it look like a, a really tacky kind of 80s aquarium. But it's just not safe for your dragon. Walnut sand and uh, corn cob kind of deal with it in the same way. So corn cob is pushed out there as being a food source. So they can live on it because they can eat it. But they also poo in it. So encouraging them to eat it is probably not a good idea. The other problem with the corn cob stuff is it's essentially dehydrated. So when they eat it and it goes into their gut, it absorbs the moisture in their gut and it expands and it then gets stuck. Exoterra made a statement basically saying that we will never ever make a corn cob substrate. Now, not to sound awful, but if Exoterra are making a statement on it, then it's probably not a good thing. Those guys make some very questionable products that aren't necessarily bad for the animals, but they're done from an aesthetic side point and that kind of thing, or that kind of stuff. They've basically said, we'll never do it because corn cob is not digestible. And they are right. Corn cob is not a digestible substrate. That's exactly how it's pushed. And it's pushed for the simple fact that it's cheap. <laughs> so money talks when it comes to that kind of thing. So yeah, please don't use, wall, uh, use corn cob for your dragons. It's just not worth the risk. And it looks awful. And it doesn't support them as well. It's quite loose and quite shifting. So when they're stood on it, they start to get the same problems that we would get on bare floors, they're just not supported in the right way. It also, when it gets wet, grows this really weird mould. Um, it can happen even under a water bowl that you've not even tipped, um, but it can also happen where they're pooing on it and you don't quite get the moisture out of it, things like that. It's just not a good substrate choice. Walnut sand, similarly, it's put out there because it's made of walnuts, it's digestible, it's food source. It's not. It's very, very dusty. It's it's not completely digestible, it's, it's, it's walnut shell, not actual walnut. Um, so although it's not as bad as the other two, it's still, it, it's not a natural substrate. It's not something that's gonna benefit your dragon in any other way really, and it's not that cheap either. So really it's just one that needs to kind of disappear. Beach chippings. Beach chippings are a very double-edged sword for me. Um, I used to keep bearded dragons on beach chippings as a standard. Um, we have never had a problem with impaction. I've still never had a problem with impaction on beach chippings or orchid bark either. Um, but many, many people have. And again, it's not the substrate's fault. It's generally, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but there are a lot of reasons why impaction is a problem. But the actual substrate choice isn't always one of them. Wood chip for me, a couple of plus sides. Um, as babies, it's bigger than their head if you use the coarse grade, so they can't swallow it. They physically can't get it down. If you're using the fine grade chippings, then yeah, there is a risk of meeting it, and I completely understand why people will be wary of that. It's quite easy to clean, but on the same side as the corn cob and things like that, it doesn't really break down very easily, so if it is ingested, it could cause problems that way. I used it for a lot of years, and if I'm kind of stuck for a soil mix, I will still use it now. But I completely understand people not using it because there is an element of risk to it and it isn't the most attractive substrate. 
Um, and because it doesn't quite hold for, for digging and things like that is why I moved away from it. But I wouldn't really condemn someone for using it. Um, I've never really seen anything that tells me wood chip is absolutely a terrible substrate. The final option is sand and soil mixes like we've just talked about, and yeah, that's what you should use, basically. <laughs> um, any variation on it, it's what, a lot of it comes down to aesthetics, so Leo Life is yellow, Beardy Life is red, Arid Life is a little bit more sandy. Mix them up. Beardy Life and Leo Life look amazing mixed. <laughs> um, they've got a bit of clay in there as well, so if you give it a little, it is slightly damp when it comes out, but if you give it a little mix with water when you first get it, and then pack it down, you can make little sand castles out of it as well, which is fantastic. Lucky Reptile Desert Bedding, you can properly make into sandcastles. It's very dusty, is that substrate. It's not so much a problem for the dragon, but your house will never be clean again. Um, but it's re it looks really, really cool. Uh, a few people have used kind of desert bedding to make a sandcastle or a, a kind of rock form thing, and then used a loose substrate around the base so that they can scrub that, uh, scrub that clean, sorry, but then remove the loose substrate at the bottom. All of these impaction scares are all blamed on those substrates, doesn't matter which one, all blamed on that. So there are people who have gone with this, no risk keeping, and it is completely unnatural. And unfortunately it gave birth to the plastic prison kind of keeping, um, which we will get to in the end bit. Um, so yeah, loose substrate does not cause impaction, but some loose substrates add to it more than others. So things like the calcium sand and that kind of thing that we've discussed, their problems add to these other problems. Dehydration is probably the most common one that we see, especially with bearded dragons that are kept without water, or bearded dragons that don't eat veg, which again is another thing that we're going to come to in the diet section. Um, a well hydrated dragon can pass sand, it can pass soil. Um, I, we use a lot of leaf litter in some of our enclosures, and I have seen this dragon pull out leaves whole, um, well, partly digested. It's a normal thing for them to do. In the wild, it's dusty, it's rocky, there's gravel, there's sand, there's soil. These guys are built to pass a few pieces. Now, obviously, if they were intentionally eating it in large amounts, that's when there's a problem. But dehydration stops things moving along as they should inside. It can cause sort of like peristalsis not to work properly, and it ends up where things get stuck in their gut because there just isn't the moisture to move them along. On a similar note to that, supplementation as well is a big thing. If an animal is deficient in a mineral, they will go looking for it in their environment. Now, I don't know if any of you've heard of sort of like elephants in Africa, some of them visit salt licks and they actually get their salt requirements out of these rocks and they eat the rocks. Those elephants don't suddenly die of impaction because otherwise they are healthy. In the same way as a dragon accidentally eating uh, substrate will pass it as long as the rest of its supplements are fine so calcium levels are done properly vitamin and mineral uh, levels are, pro uh, are appropriate because that all links again into kind of the system working normally so peristalsis the movement of food through the gut all that has to be working properly for the animal to pass that out if the animal is so deficient that it begins eating its substrate in large amounts then yeah the substrate is going to be the problem but its underlying health problems are what's actually causing it so you would then look at moving that animal off of substrate and of course seeking veterinary advice as well another reason and it's kind of linked together with that one um, is heat so all of these things go hand in hand and it's all really proper care and um, without kind of sounding too brutal about it keeping the animals properly is what keeps impaction in check basically so appropriate temperatures. So this whole dropping the temperature to lower as an adult, again, is probably part of the reason that impaction was seen so commonly in bearded dragons, especially older bearded dragons. Um, so yeah, temperatures need to be exactly what we've discussed. None of this dropping it down when they're older, none of this cutting corners on the heat mats and things like that. Make sure they're given the right heat in the right way to digest food, to move everything through their gut properly. And then again, accidental ingestion won't hurt them and UVB does play a little role in that as well again it's just for sort of calcium absorption that kind of thing um, but UV would then link into sort of deficiency and that would then probably cause a geophagy and intentional swallowing of substrate obesity is also another major factor especially in bearded dragons there is a real tendency with bearded dragons to make them morbidly obese um, these guys are almost vegetarian as adults. A good 70-80% of their natural diet is leaves, flowers, plants, and that kind of thing. 
with insects, other lizards, small marsupials and rodents making up another portion of their diet. If they are only fed insects and never allowed the fibre and moisture that comes from eating vegetables and weeds and flowers and plants, they will start to get bunged up. They will start to, if they are accidentally uh, ingesting substrate, that will start to stop moving through because they're not moving properly. And constipation caused by overfeeding and that kind of thing on the wrong diet can also lead to impaction. They can also get impacted from their food if they're in that state as well. So a dragon that's been constantly filled up with hard-shelled insects, especially things like mealworms, morios, even dubia roaches, that isn't provided with all the other things we've talked about, can actually get impaction from the shells of the insects. It's rare and it's usually linked to some other issue, but it is another way that that can become a problem. So to kind of conclude the substrate debate, and this is usually the response that everyone comes to online when you're speaking to sort of a balanced audience is that as long as temperature, UV, hydration, diet, humidity and supplements are all spot on or as near as we know to be spot on then you can use a loose substrate that is safe to use so something that is natural like sands, soils, clays, mixes, maybe wood chips if you're that way inclined but please avoid the artificial substrates like corn cob, calci sand and walnut sand and you should never have a problem with impaction <laughs> fingers crossed if you do suspect your animal is impacted please go to a vet it is a very very serious issue and it can cause some serious health issues and it can kill them but please do not think it is because a pet shop sold you beardy life for your bearded dragon just because we were trying to make money we sell beardy life because it is a good product and it's very close to what they would live on in the wild in the same way as we sell all the other soil mixes because it is a good way to recreate your animal's natural environment and basically give it what it needs as well popped her back because she was starting to wake up <laughs> um so diet in bearded dragons is another kind of not so much misconception but people still do it really wrong and there is really no reason to. Um, bearded dragons are designed to live on quite small amounts of food. And there is a tendency with pretty much all captive reptiles and even captive mammals to overfeed them because we think a big fat animal is happy and healthy and that kind of is well fed. And especially with bearded dragons because they tend to be an entry level animal, people tend to come at it from a mammalian standpoint. So if your hamster, for example, didn't eat for four months, it would 100% probably die. If your bearded dragon does that at the right time of year, it's probably just brumating and it's something they've adapted to do. And that kind of goes as part of their active feeding period as well. So a, bearded, ba ba a baby bearded dragon is designed to grow very, very quickly. These guys can reach full size in as little as sort of 12 to 18 months um, and they will even breed, be up to breeding size in about 9 or 10 months, although it's not necessarily a healthy way to breed them. There is this kind of push to feed bearded dragons as much as they will eat, as often as they will eat when they're little, and it's not particularly healthy. So I'll explain that. You will hear in a lot of care sheets that they should be fed bugs three times a day, and they should also have veg available as well. Now, that is kind of true, although what you're really doing is pushing that animal's growth in the same way as if I fed a baby corn snake two or three times a week, it would 100% eat it, but that animal's growth will be pushed to a point that we would actually class that as power feeding. And that's kind of the same in bearded dragons. Hatchling beardies should be fed daily, if not twice daily on the invertebrates. They have very high protein need, they are trying to grow very, very quickly because that's to do with predator avoidance. Obviously the bigger you get before winter, the more chance you've got of surviving winter because even the babies go underground and don't eat as much through winter. But three times a day on as much as it will eat, you are overfeeding that animal. So you'll often see baby beardies that are like a little, little circle from above with this little tail, little head stuck out of it. And that's not necessarily a healthy way for them to look. I am not saying that you shouldn't feed your baby bearded dragon well, because of, otherwise we run into the problems with them being underweight, but even a baby dragon can be overfed. Feeding them daily on bugs and that kind of thing gets them growing, all that. Um, I'm not really going to go into supplements and, and gut loading on this, on this video, but make sure that you're doing all that as well, and we will do proper videos on supplementation and gut loading and things like that at a later date, because it is an area that people get a little bit confused about as well. So as long as they are being fed well-fed insects and a good variety of veg as well, and there's tons of information on what veg they can eat, the dragon will grow healthily on one or two bug meals a day for the first three or four months. 
we have to, as they grow, cut this food down. If we keep feeding a dragon until it's, say, a year old on bugs every single day, it will definitely eat them because they are designed to eat what's available. These animals have evolved in an area where food is not in surplus, so they have to eat things like termites is a large part of their wild diet. They're there in abundance, they can sit and gorge themselves, but they don't have access to 150 dubia roaches daily that are covered in calcium, that are perfectly gut loaded and all this, and dubias in particular, because they're so high in protein, you're going to push that growth. So I've seen baby beardies go from tiny hatchlings up to about 18 inches in their first nine months, which is frighteningly quick growth rate. If we don't cut this back, the animals become obese. And obesity is the number one health issue that we see in bearded dragons in captivity. An adult beardy can live on insects once or twice a week and then it will eat veg for the rest of the week. That is a healthy way to keep these animals trim. Wild bearded dragons weigh between sort of 200 and, four and 350 grams. Um, most captive dragons you're talking more like 300 to I think the heaviest I've ever seen was about 800 grams and it was one of the most grotesque animals I've ever had the misfortune of dealing with. Um, they shouldn't look like a barrel on legs, they really shouldn't, they should be quite lean, they should be muscular, especially males, you tend to find males have really thick forearms when they're well fed but not overfed. A dragon as well, when you look at them from the top, should have big wrinkles down the side, they should almost be, not quite teardrops, but almost like a long oval in, in shape. If we're starting to see them become more round when they're walking, or if their belly's starting to hang down, they are simply being overfed. Now, a dragon that's just eaten a meal will have a belly. You can't do anything about that. But a dragon that's empty should look fairly empty. I think the misconception started really in that bearded dragons, when they're well fed, are round. And those pictures were then put onto the internet, and everyone saw that dragon and went, oh, mine's underweight, I need to feed it more. Dragons store their fat in their tail, in the same way as a leopard gecko, but not to the same extreme. So when we have a dragon with a nice square or slightly rounded tail base, sort of in cross section, we know we're doing things right. The stomach will go up and down depending on how much food they've had that day, that week, whatever. If we have an animal that is permanently inflated, essentially, that animal is being overfed and could actually be storing fat around its organs, which is super unhealthy, just as it would be in us. So we see dragons that are like four or five hundred grams and they're only like 18 inches long. These animals are obese and they will not live the same life as a healthy lean dragon would do. Um, and there's a few ways to sort of combat that. One is just feeding properly in the first place. Um, enforcing brumation is a good way to take your animal's weight down a notch. So if you have an animal that has really gained some weight through summer, you could then look at brumating it through winter to try and then sort of cut that back. Another major cause for this is uh, obesity or propensity for obesity is that these animals are designed to store fat so they have evolved to get a fat store that will then see them through winter so you are feeding something high fat high protein food that is far more nutritious than it would probably be finding in the wild in much larger amounts than it would be finding in the wild and that animal goes this is great i'll store it all so the kind of term junk in the trunk is kind of what these animals are aiming for that then sees them through three or four months a year where they eat absolutely nothing and they just become completely dormant Another big, big part of this is hand feeding. Now, bearded dragons are active hunters. They will aggressively chase anything that moves in the wild. They will eat each other. They will eat small skinks, small geckos. They've even been taking like nestling birds, small rodents and marsupials. A dragon that won't chase bugs simply doesn't need to chase bugs. You don't then have to start hand feeding it more or worms every hour on the hour just to make sure it's eating something. A dragon knows how much it needs to eat, and if they've got to the point where they're just not chasing food, that animal is full, like full to the point of not needing food for a very long time. <laughs> so it's all about management, and like I say, these misconceptions of you should feed them this much to this age and this much to this age, it doesn't work long term. Um, there are guidelines, and Bit of Dragon Owners UK um, is a great forum for this, and although, yes, they do kind of push them all like two or three times a day on bugs and that kind of thing as youngsters, they're a little bit more conservative with the way that they push it forward. So by the time they're a year old, they should be getting bugs three times a week, which I think is a fair kind of level to be at. If we don't 
sort of allow the animal to hunt. It's not burning energy while it's getting food. So every time we hand feed an animal something like a morial worm or anything, or something that we would class as a treat, which is a completely alien concept to these animals, they have no idea that they're being treated to something that they shouldn't really be having. We just add fat, and we add fat without burning anything in the process. So making your animal hunt for its food and think for its food is a good way to keep their weight down. And then obviously frequency of feeding is probably the biggest thing. Now a dragon can eat as much as it wants to eat once or twice a week as an adult. Same with the veg. If it likes two or three bowls of veg a day, give them it because that isn't putting weight on them. That's really just giving them energy to keep going. Another thing that kind of links into this obesity is the feeding of fruits. Now sugar, just like in us, causes obesity. We don't want these animals having high sugar diets all the time. The odd strawberry, the odd bit of melon, it's not going to hurt them. But where these guys are from, fruit is not something that they would really encounter, if at all, really. Um, but if you want to give them something different, flowers are a fantastic food. So hibiscus, nasturtium, they're all great flowers. They're all very high in uh, certain vitamins as well, so it's very good to kind of vary the diet that way. You can use bits of vegetables and bits of like carrot, courgette, sweet potato, butternut squash all good for kind of mixing up the variety, but leaves need to be kind of the staple part of their diet. One of the biggest things that I get asked regarding diet is my dragon will not eat veg. And I must have this conversation weekly, if not more than weekly. These animals do not have the capacity to be fussy unless they are pushed into doing it by being overfed by their carer. If bugs are available in large numbers and high frequency, these animals just think, eh, I'll get the veg later. They don't necessarily need that if they're being fed high protein, high fat diets like crickets, locusts, morios, whatever. The simplest fix to it, stop feeding them bugs. <laughs> A dragon over about six months should be starting to eat veg fairly regularly. Maybe not daily, but regularly, or at least picking daily. And that's when we see the shift in their diet up to being about a year old, where they should then be almost vegetarian and getting bugs two or three times a week. We see adult dragons that eat nothing but bugs, or they will only eat a certain bug, or they will only eat a certain veg. Those dragons are not picky, they are not fussy, they are simply obese. And it's not necessarily external, it's just that that fat store is big enough that the animal thinks, I don't need to get up today, I won't chase that cricket, I won't grab that locust, I'll wait for that Morio to come, I'll wait for that Pachnoda grub to come. It's all man-made, it's all very, very fixable, but it all leads then onto these problems in later life. And like I said earlier, it can be linked to impaction, it can be linked to shortened lifespan. You can really do some damage by kind of loving your dragon too much. I get it. We want to feed our pets, we want to make sure our pets are well fed, but by doing so, we are opening them up to an awful lot of problems. So feeding them the appropriate amount <laughs> in an appropriate way, so making them hunt rather than hand feeding, is what the animal needs to stay healthy. And they'll thank you for it long term. <laughs> um, so we now see dragons living into their teens. I believe there's still a dragon alive that's 18 or 19 years old now. I'm not sure if he's passed away yet. Um, but we used to see dragons that at nine, ten years old were showing serious signs of old age and most of these dragons would have been overfed or underheated or underhydrated and that kind of thing through all these misconceptions that we talked about. So yeah, diet, it's so simple. Mostly veg as an adult, bugs here and there and variety. Keep varying that diet. If you stick to one type of food, you are limiting your animal's intake. It can't get all the vitamins it needs, no matter how much supplement. It can't get all the different kind of types of fiber and protein and fats and all these different things that are found in different amounts in different foods. They should all be included. So even things like waxworms that are kind of demonized on the internet, as you bearded should only have one or two waxworms a week or it'll just pile the weight on. It's simply not true. Waxworms are actually really high in sugar. Um, and that's why they become very fatty for our animals and why they're quite addictive for our animals. Waxworms are long lasting if they're kept cool. So you can use waxworms as a supplement to pretty much every meal if you really want to. Um, but if we sit a tub of waxworms in front of a dragon, it'll eat the lot because they're only tiny. And we then hear, oh, well, it only eat waxworms. Yeah, but if you stop giving him waxworms and leave it long enough for him to be hungry, he will eat everything else as well. And we hear the same for morios, we hear the same for dubia roaches, we hear the same for locusts. And we definitely, definitely hear it for crickets. Crickets being fast moving and low reward as far as size, the dragons are less inclined to eat them if they're then offered big winged locust or big morio worms in a dish. It's all the kind of workout for energy in kind of 
uh, mathematics going on. These animals know what high reward food is. They know that if they have to run around and chase it, they need to eat a lot more of it to get that energy back. But they also know if they sit next to a dish and it's filled up with more oil worms four times a week, they'll be right. So they'll sit and wait and they'll think, oh, well, we're in a good time of year. I don't necessarily need to go out. And a lot of it is a survival thing, is that if they don't need to go hunting for food, if they don't need to go chasing food, that then stops them becoming food for something else down the line. So yeah, balance is key, variety is key. Stick to kind of less is more, especially with adults, um, but babies, you can feed them daily. You, well, you should feed them daily. Um, but we don't want to go to the point where we're making these animals obese before they're even six months old. Because although, yes, they will put it all into growth, the more we push this growth, the more we open them up to things like metabolic bone disease and other sort of like deformities that we see as well. So birth defects tend to get worse in bearded dragons and a lot of it could be linked to the amount that we feed them as babies to try and make them grow quicker. Whereas if they were grown steadily, MVD wouldn't be so much of an issue, the same as it isn't in the wild. These deformities and things may not become worse over time because they're not straining to kind of grow new bone, grow new muscle. So yeah, it's kind of better for your dragon to just slow and steady wins the race. We're not trying to get them big, we're not trying to make them up to a certain breeding size, which is where a lot of this comes from, is breeders push them to that size to try and get them laying eggs quicker. But nowadays we just don't need that level of growth out of a pet, it's just not healthy for them. And long term, it could be causing a lot of damage to their organs and that kind of thing, exactly the same as it does with snakes that are pushed and pushed and pushed. They just don't live as long and they just don't have as good a life out of it as well. The final area that I want to touch on before we kind of round all this off, <laughs> this incredibly long video off, um, is bearded dragons as pets. Now, there is absolutely no denying these guys make fantastic pets, especially for first time keepers, people that want something more interactive, people that want something that's more of a family pet, that's going to kind of want their attention and, and be out and about with the family and, and enjoy that interaction. The problem is this gets pushed a little bit too far. A bit like with the feeding, we kind of think that because the animal tolerates coming out and seems to enjoy investigating a room or gravitates towards one person, that these animals have much more complex relationships with us than they actually do. Probably going to get shot for this, but bearded dragons do not love their owners. It's been debated to hell and back. It's not a thing. They learn very quickly who feeds them, they will learn who has positive influence in their life and who doesn't. But if an animal, uh, sorry, if a bearded dragon then moves house and there is a new person feeding it and a new person being the positive influence and a new person never does anything wrong to it, the animal will simply adopt them into their life as this non-threatening entity that brings food. They do not suddenly sit there missing their old owners or only like one person. Now, don't get me wrong, it is true, they can dislike people just like any animal can, but this level of kind of saying that they, they bond to their owners, it's just not there. It's just not something that reptiles in general do. A lot of it is linked to reptiles don't raise their own uh, young, uh, in general, certain species skink do, but most reptiles lay their eggs or give birth and that's it, job done, nature take your course after that. Because of that, they have no real social bonding. Um, so a bearded dragon, although they are kind of social because they have a social, um, a social structure and a way of socially communicating, but they don't live in tight-knit families, so say like a pack of wolves or a pride of lions, they don't have that bond where if they were suddenly removed from that group, they would be lost and unable to survive. Pack mentality isn't something that exists in a lot of reptiles, especially bearded dragons, who are notorious for being incredibly aggressive towards each other. Um, and the same goes for their human keepers, is they don't see us as this other dragon that they want to love. It's simply that you provide food, you are completely non-threatening, you're interesting to explore, and you are a part of their life that's positive, or at least neutral <laughs> in some cases. Um, this kind of big misconception that they are these scaly babies, and I despise that term, <laughs> but they are these scaly babies, um, has led to what I call plastic prison keeping. And plastic prisons are when you see bearded dragons with doll beds and curtains and furniture and all this kind of stuff, it's just not good for them. The fibres in some of the fabrics that they use aren't designed to be heated. Um, they're a massive fire hazard. 
Um, we don't know what chemicals come off some of these plastic toys that people put in there. A lot of this isn't designed to be at 45 degrees Celsius. It's not tested to be at 45 degrees Celsius. Whereas cork bark, rocks, that kind of thing, they, they get warm. It's fine. You're not going to damage your animal doing that. Beardies have this strange thing about wanting to be on soft surfaces. It's comfort. I get it. So if you give an animal a cushion, it's probably going to sit on that instead of a hard rock floor. Doesn't mean that you have to provide a cushion or a bed or whatever for your bearded dragon to be happy in captivity. And genuinely, every beardy I've ever seen in a plastic prison just looks depressed and just like they just wanted to end. They look so down, they're usually overweight as well because they won't eat veg and they'll only be hand-fed Morios and all this kind of thing. And it tends to come from a really kind of misguided angle, is probably the best way <laughs> to describe it. Um, bearded dragons are not dogs, they are not puppies. They will not fill that same void that a puppy would or having a cat in some extremes would. They don't want our attention, they don't need our attention, but they're quite happy to tolerate it and they're quite happy to interact because we are completely non-threatening. But it doesn't mean you have to treat it like a child. It doesn't need dressing up, and that's another thing I hate, is dressing up bearded dragons or any reptile. It's stressful, they don't like it, it's restraining, things like bloody bat wings that people put on them and all this. It's a restraint to them, it's uncomfortable, it's very alien to have something wrapped around you when Really, the only time that animal would experience that is when it's being caught by a predator. It's why when we're handling dragons, we don't sort of go in and grab them, because that is a very threatening thing to these animals. So to restrain it and tie something around its legs or putting something on it that it really doesn't want to wear is very restraining, and you tend to find that they then sit still, because they have absolutely no idea what's going on. I'm not trying to kill the vibe on bearded dragons are amazing pets because they are. They really are. They're about as pet as lizards get when it comes to sort of like social interaction and being a family pet. And they have so much personality and they're so charming and so inquisitive. Same as like blue tongue skinks, same sort of thing, but they get the same treatment, this kind of babying and mothering, and it's just not good for them. They don't need it, they don't want it. All you're really doing is stressing out an animal that just could do without it, really. When it comes to handling them and things like that, they like it. You are something to explore, you are something interesting, and let's say you're non-threatening, so it's a great way for them to exercise as being out and about in a room. Obviously, temperature being a thing, obviously we don't want to do it when it's too cold, but that's all common sense kind of stuff. If your animal becomes a bit lethargic, it probably needs to warm back up. Taking them outside is one thing. So like we discussed earlier with the UV index and the heat and stuff, taking them outside in the garden is one thing to have a bask in the benefits of sunlight. Taking them to the shops, yes people do it, <laughs> is not beneficial. It is sensory overload for these animals. They have no idea where they are. They're incredibly territorial, so they don't like leaving their sort of immediate surroundings that they know and they know where everything is because they feel unsafe, they feel threatened. Dragons have a real tendency to freeze when they're scared. So this whole, oh, he just sits on my shoulder. Yeah, because he's got absolutely no idea what else to do. They also do this kind of, it's more common in iguanas, but beardies will do it. And if you ever see a dragon doing it, you'll know exactly what I mean. It's like this crazy eye and their pupils dilate really, really quickly. Um, and their eye almost changes shape. That is not a good sign. <laughs> and you see it in dragons that are put outside straight away. We even see it when we're transporting dragons. If the box, say like the box is uncovered in the car or something, when you're just checking on your animal, its eyes will go crazy because it's no idea where it is and they're really, really stressed out. So taking them to the shops around all these people, all these new smells, sights, sounds, birds, all this kind of thing is really scary for a dragon. They don't enjoy it, they certainly don't need it. And being sat on your shoulder in summer in the UK is not beneficial to their health. They need to be in that heat, in that UV, for most of the day in order to stay healthy. So yeah, please don't take your dragon down the park and that kind of thing. And it goes into other reptiles as well. Don't take your giant monitor lizard down the park or your retic down the park because the chances are something will eventually go wrong. And all it does is we look bad then as a community because we're the ones forcing these animals into the public and on a very basic level we are denying them what they really need to stay healthy. So if we take them out of their kind of well-designed vivarium, so we go through all this to get the right temperatures, right UV, right subject, everything's perfect and then we just walk them down the shop. 
everything we've put that work into doesn't matter because it's now in completely the wrong environment, it's stressed out, we're not doing that animal any favours. And some people are genuinely scared of dragons. Some people think they are really, really scary. And I get it. I, I personally find hamsters terrifying. <laughs> I think they are one of the most frightening little balls of evil. Um, so if someone hands me a hamster, no, I'm out. So I wouldn't want to put a bearded dragon in someone's face in a supermarket that is genuinely frightened of reptiles in general. Same with snakes and all that kind of thing. It's just not a good look for the hobby. It's not a good look for the community. And it's things like that that then push anti-pet keeping groups to kind of go, well, they don't keep it properly. And uh, oh, well, they're, they're endangering the public. Um, there is a, a big push by a couple of anti-pet keeping groups at the minute that reptiles all carry salmonella and that they are a, a, essentially a biohazard um, to the public. So if you're there handing around your bearded dragon to all these kids in the park and one of them doesn't wash their hands and ends up getting salmonella, all you're doing is proving a point. It's just not worth the risk for the sake of a bit of attention. And that's what a lot of it comes down to. People go, wow, look at the lizard on your shoulder. There's no reason, there's no benefit. Please just don't do it. Keep your animal healthy and interacting in the house where it should be and where you know it's safe and it's not going to run into the road or anything like that. It's just not worth the, prob uh, worth the problems that it brings out. Okay. On the handling side of things, um, bearded dragons kind of enjoy handling. And I say that kind of a bit <laughs> through gritted teeth. Beardies are one of the most tolerant reptiles I've ever come across, barring maybe blue tongue skinks. Um, and it does seem like they enjoy handling. They really like the investigation and the inquisitiveness. But like we just said, there are limits to that. We don't want to go too far with it. So yeah, giving the animal someone to explore, giving the animal a place to explore, and, and even like stroking and things like that, they do seem to quite like it. However, if you are stroking your dragon's head and it closes its eyes, it is not asleep. Lizards have a very strange and pretty daft defence mechanism is that they close their eyes and it's very much a case of out of sight, out of mind and it's a fear response or a stress response. If they can't see it happening, it's probably not happening. <laughs> it's not really a survival skill at all, it's more just like uh, closing yourself off. Um, but if your dragon sits there and falls asleep on you and things like that, it's not necessarily that it's comfortable, it's more that it's cold and that it's just not got the energy to run around. And if it's falling asleep while you're stroking the top of its head, you're actually just kind of stressing it out a little bit. It sounds awful to say, but it, it, is, it is true. <laughs> um, dragons that fall asleep on their owner's shoulders um, generally are just a bit chilly. So they go to sleep because that's what they do on a night when it gets cooler, they go to sleep. Um, and as we tend to handle our animals in the evening after work or after school, they're already getting towards bedtime. So this whole kind of, well, we get him out and then he falls asleep on my shoulder before we put him back. You're just comfortable. It's not necessarily that he has bonded to you or anything like that. So yeah, like I said, I'm not trying to kill <laughs> the kind of, the attitude that we have to these animals because they are fantastic pets. They're just not, they're not quite the same as mammals in that they form these bonds. And it is a huge misconception that I always feel bad kind of explaining to people um but yeah it's they do they do like us they do tolerate us they're, they're quite happy to be handled and it is a good thing for them to be interactive with because it's mental stimulation and that kind of thing but please don't think that your dragon needs you or that it needs your attention you are just a positive part of its life but you're not it's it's not bonded to you or anything like that because once that mindset gets in we then start getting people doing a lot of the other stuff that we've talked about, it then is, oh, well, my baby must eat and, and, and all this. And it, it just seems to open it up to this really strange way of keeping these animals and it, it doesn't do them any favours. It doesn't lead to a better dragon just because you love it that bit harder or you think it loves you. You can still keep your animal healthy. In the same ways, for me, bearded dragons, they're my stock. So although I enjoy my beardies and there's always individuals that you get quite attached to, in no way do I think that if suddenly I wasn't looking after them, these animals would suddenly go into a massive depression and they need me and, and me going in there every day and doing their water and their veg and saying hi and giving them a quick stroke on the chin, that to them isn't, it's not the same as stroking your dog or, or cuddling your cat. They don't want that same interaction, they certainly don't need that same interaction. And I suppose to an extent they don't understand that interaction, it's not something that kind of computes with them, um, which is why I kind of like being stuffed in your coat and carried down the shops. 
again it's restraining it's it's stressful um because it's just not something that they, they look for they're not looking to be cuddled okay so yeah so that ranty bit is over with. um i hope you have learned some stuff i hope it's kind of got rid of a few of the internet misconceptions and most of them are from the internet um, because these animals, they are great to keep and they're very simple to keep, but it can be so complicated if you try and make every single aspect of what's out there a reality in your keeping. If you try and do every single far-fetched point, so we keep them on tiles, we give them a bed, we do this, we have to handle it four times a day, we have to feed it 17 times a day, you will just make these animals complicated and long-term you'll just cause health problems and then they get more complicated because you then need a vet. Um, so yeah, if you just stick to the common sense things, things that make sense is the best way to keep your bearded dragon. So all the temperatures we've talked about, the UV that we've talked about, the interaction that they can get from you is all brilliant and it's what makes these animals the mainstay of the hobby for so many years. And they are the ultimate pet lizard. You won't find much that really rivals these guys as far as interaction, intelligence. They're, they're cute as well, I mean, you can't deny bearded, they're quite cute. Um, it's just getting people to understand that they are essentially wild animals. They are adapted to a very specific environment. And if that isn't provided, it doesn't matter how much you love this animal, you still won't be keeping it correctly. And that's what we still see even to this day. After 30, 40 years of keeping these animals in captivity, we're still doing things wrong. And a lot of it comes from all these myths and misconceptions that just don't need to exist anymore. If it was... If everyone kept them in a natural, kind of stimulating way, we'd all enjoy them a lot more. And I think less would end up in rescues as well. Because I think once they start showing health problems like MBD or impaction and things like that and they need a vet, people get rid. And we see a lot in rescues where they're, they're just emaciated, they're underfed, or they're completely obese. And there isn't really a reason for it apart from they were just never told right in the first place. So I think if sellers, that's breeders, shops, even rescues as well, because rescues can be just as bad for missing fallen people, um, all kind of started hitting the same baseline of this is what's generally accepted. Beardy Vet, honestly, if you've not looked at him, find him on, on Facebook and go through that information because it will completely change your mind on how you keep dragons if you don't already do it that way anyway. So yeah, I hope this has been helpful. Yes, it's been around. Yes, it's a long slog. <laughs> um, but I really, really do hope that this video has done what I wanted it to do and basically just simplify the keeping of these animals because they deserve better than they're getting, really. In the same way as we run about with the boss, there's nothing that we can't provide them. It's just knowing what to do to provide that. Um, for sort of long-term care and that kind of thing. So yeah, I hope you have enjoyed it. I know it's been a long one. <laughs> this will probably be the longest video we ever do um, because there's just so much to cover with these guys. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching again and I shall uh, see you next time. Thanks guys, bye.